Um, I think that's where I'm going to really focus on today is the everyday life in New York and uh, the fun that you could have uh, doing that as a staffer for one of the New York City tabloids, the New York Post. Uh, I'm going to start at the beginning. Um, I've had an interesting career. Most of it has been staff. Um, like uh, many of the visitors to the photo brigade meetups and the podcasts, uh, I am a high school photo and AV geek and a band geek. Um, that's where it all started in the summer of 1992. Uh, that was between my freshman and sophomore year of high school. Uh, I went to a yearbook workshop where I got my real first black and white darkroom experience and uh, went home, built myself a darkroom in the basement, and it's all history from there. Um, I grew up in Staten Island. Uh, I guess I should do this as a slideshow. There we are. Um, I'm a Staten Island native. Um, our local newspaper, the Staten Island Advance, or the Advance, if you're a local, um, had this uh, interesting opportunity for high school students. Um, there was a program called Teenage. It was a weekly uh, section in the Sunday newspaper. And it was completely done from start to finish. Uh, pitching stories, uh, uh, reporting, photography, layout and design, all done by high school students. Uh, it was something you had to apply into, um, which I didn't know. Uh, I walked into the Staten Island Advances newsroom uh, cold with some really awful black and white prints of police horses and rollerbladers in Washington Square Park and said, I'm interested in joining this section. They said, oh, we take applications uh, once a year before the summer. And uh, you apply in, I said, uh, you know, there's a little writing, you know, excerpt that you have to submit. I'm like, wait, 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 wait a second, writing? Um, I said, you know, I'm here to, to do photography. I showed my really awful black and white prints. And they said, great, here's your first assignment. Um, as far as I know, I was the first person, uh, student, to inquire about doing photography for the section. Because up until that point, uh, the photos were taken by their staffers. Would have to go out on assignment with a teenage reporter and, and shoot their art. Um, so one of those first assignments, um, 20 years ago, um, I had to go to the Tower Records on West 4th Street and Broadway, which no longer exists. Um, and there was a record you know, uh, event with Morrissey of the Smiths. And uh, I had to find a Staten Islander, of course, in the crowd, because uh, being from the local paper, everything is really hyper-local focused. Um, so I'm going down like the row of people queued up outside, which went around the block, finding a Staten Islander. And here she is, uh, Tracy Delaney. Uh, and then I had to wait for her to get up to the front of the line and elbow my way into like the crowds that were inside. And I think I elbowed a Rolling Stone photographer out of the way. Sorry, Rolling Stone. Uh, to get my picture of this Staten Islander with Marcy. Um, after uh, my teenage uh, experience, it really solidified that I wanted to try to do uh, photography and especially newspaper photography for a living. Um, after school, uh, I got my first really professional position as the photo assistant in the New York Bureau of the Associated Press, uh, which was the best 18-month uh, learning experience of, of my life. Um, this photo was taken just a couple weeks before 9-11 in 2001. A French stuntman um, wanted to bungee jump. Oh, he, he wanted to parachute from a plane land on the torch of the Statue of Liberty, and then perform a bungee jump. Uh, things went horribly wrong, uh, and he got caught up on the torch of the Statue of Liberty. And uh, working as a desk assistant, I really was, wasn't responsible for going out and shooting assignments. But given my you know, Staten Island proximity to the Statue of Liberty, um, I got a phone call saying, there's this breaking news going on. So I ran down to the ferry, hopped on the boat, and uh, made this picture, which made the wire. and. Uh, newspapers around the country. This is uh, Venus and Serena Williams, for those of you who don't know. Um, this picture is 14 years old tomorrow. Uh, this was the first time that the sisters faced each other in a final. Um, it was my last day at the AP. Uh, I knew I was only working there 18 months, and then I would have to part ways. And I never really wanted to go the editor's route, which is if I became a full-time employee there, 
that's the route you know, I, I would have gone. Uh, I wanted to be a photographer. Uh, so while field editing at the US Open for my last two weeks at the AP, I decided I wanted to go out and try to make as many pictures as I can. Maybe something would make the wire. Um, so I had heard like, you know, some scuttlebutt around that uh, the sisters were practicing together uh, on one of the practice fields way off in like the back of the grounds. Um, and I pulled a 500, you know, out of the AP workroom and, you know, went out there with my film camera um, and was shooting through the fence, the practice court, and, you know, the picture, you know, the, was going to be the two of them together, but, you know, while they were volleying back and forth, you know, that picture didn't happen. And I waited for the two of them, you know, hopefully to, you know, come off the, the court and they walked together and there was this beautiful sunset, sunset light and it all just kind of came together. Um, after my uh, staff time at the AP, uh, I went freelance. Uh, so uh, my birthday, uh, September 8th tomorrow, uh, was my last day at the AP and uh, three days later was 9-11. So there was plenty of work to go around for the freelancers. And the few images that I had done while I was on the desk proved to them that I was capable of handling a news assignment. Um, so I immediately got thrown into the freelance you know, uh, pool of people. Um, there was a lot of Staten Island work to go around. Uh, so I became a freelancer working for the AP and uh, some other newspapers. And then I transitioned to my first uh, staff job uh, at, back at the Staten Island Advance. Um, this was the paper that I grew up with and had, you know, admired the photographer's work for years. I had, you know, clips that I had saved of pictures that inspired me. Uh, so this was my, one of my first assignments back at the Staten Island Advance. Uh, they brought me on as a freelancer first uh, to try me out. And uh, it was a primary night. And I got sent to what would have been the loser in the Republican primary. They sent one of their staffers you know, to uh, Bob Stranieri's office. Uh, so I walk into this tiny little bar in Staten Island, and it turns out um, well, you know, the Staten Island advance, when you show up to an assignment, you're always expected and you're welcomed in. Um, and uh, the, uh, then um, Vinny Ignizio, who's uh, jubilating in this photo, you know, poses with his campaign manager and a couple other people, and they expect you to take a picture, kind of like a grip and grin, and like be on your way. But I hung out because working for a wire service and freelancing for a larger newspaper, I kind of brought that perspective to the small town, you know, assignments. Um, and uh, there was an upset in the primary, and Vinny Ignizio was declared the winner. And a uh, good thing I hung out. And there's a front page. You get to see uh, every, you know, like Craig was talking about, you know, you have to go out into the community and find enterprise. Weather has a, been a constant enterprise situation in my career. Uh, anytime it's extreme, whether it's hot or cold. So uh, I was out looking for cold weather and came across a whole bunch of neighbors barbecuing in the middle of the street in a blizzard. You're also tasked at a smaller newspaper to do uh, what you would normally think is, you know, some mundane things like we're going to do a spread of Halloween decorations. How do you make that as interesting as possible? So in my travels, when I would go from assignment to assignment, I would keep like a list of houses that I thought like were interesting. And when I had the time, I would go back and photograph them. Uh, the one on the, uh, the larger photo on the bottom of the page there is mine. Um, so this, this house had these bed sheets hanging from their tree in front of their house to make them look like ghosts. Um, but just kind of hanging there in static, it really didn't look like anything. So I took the time and I set up my tripod outside of their house and waited for like a little bit of like a breeze to come by to try to blur them in the background there to give them a ghoulish appearance and make it a little bit more interesting. There's a tight shot of the photo. It wasn't that windy of a night, it could have been better. The uh, funeral for police officer uh, Russell Tomashenko. Uh, this was big city news. Um, he was executed by two gentlemen um, when Officer Tomashenko performed a, uh, a car stop in Brooklyn. Um, officer Tomashenko is a Staten Islander, so of course our local paper was big on the coverage. Um, and this was the uh, photo that ran from uh, his funeral. It's, I've covered dozens and dozens of funerals, maybe scores of funerals, you know, because of, you know, 9-11 and other things that have happened. And this was by far the most officers that I had ever seen at a, at a funeral. 
And sometimes you have to be ready for anything. I worked the night and weekend shift at the Staten Island Advance. Um, and this morning, a Saturday morning, I was covering for a daytime photographer. The night before, um, there were two separate shooting incidents and they were looking for a single suspect. Um, so, I mean, part of the job is, you know, knowing what happened the day before and being ready for and anticipating anything the next morning. So as I was driving to work early the next morning, I had the police radios on in my car already before I even got to the paper. And I heard the description of the subject's car come over that they had found it. So I immediately, like, I, I, it was just as I was pulling into the parking lot, I pulled out of the parking lot and started heading to the neighborhood. And because I got into the neighborhood early and was monitoring the police activity on the radio, I was able to position myself uh, in a place where when they cleared out the neighborhood, when they were gonna make their approach to the subject's car, that I didn't get booted because they didn't know I was there. Uh, this is one from my freelance career. It's by far my most circulated uh, photo. Um, the great blackout of 2003, I was at a courthouse in downtown Brooklyn and the lights started flickering on and off and once we heard uh, the enormity of what had happened, uh, I walk across Cadman Plaza and w started photographing like up by the Brooklyn Bridge. I came down, filed some photos and I walked back up onto the bridge and saw this mass exodus that was taking place from Manhattan because public transportation had been shut down because there was no electricity. Um, so this photo, I was on assignment for the New York Post. Uh, the AP did what they call a member pickup and ran a New York Post photo over the wires. And this photo was on scores of front pages the next day. Now, sometimes uh, working at the Post, uh, we do what's called a little edit editorial illustration. Um, we have to come up with you know, some art for a story that you were you know, specifically working on. It's not, I mean, it's a news story, but a, um, a news story with an angle we're specifically working on, so that may not necessarily happen out in the field. So um, this was actually a first person. That's our reporter, uh, Dan Cadizan, uh, talking about the turkey problem that New York City was having. There's another. Uh, Grab from some of the front pages. So I thought I would take you through some of the you know the stories um, that happened behind the photographs because that's some of the stuff that I find most interesting. Uh, with the Pope coming into town uh, in another two weeks, this is from the last papal visit. Um, when Pope Benedict came, uh, he did a mass uh, at St. Patrick's Cathedral, which was only for members of the clergy. Uh, and it's like he was a rock star even for you know, the other members of the clergy. Everyone had their cameras out and it was pretty incredible. Uh, this is one of the small town events that I've taken with me back to the post. Um, on Flag Day, um, to officially retire old and worn out U.S. flags, you ceremoniously burn them. Uh, and this happens at the Boy Scout camp uh, every year uh, in Staten Island, and they collect flags all year long at certain drop-off places, and they bring them here and they bundle them up, and they have this elaborate ceremony in a giant funeral pyre covered with, they take their biggest flag and cover all the, the rest of them and, uh, and light it. It's one of those events that uh, I, try, I, I attend every year because it could look completely different every year and it's, uh, it's interesting to try to make it look different every year. This is uh, Magnum photographer uh, Elliot Erwitt uh, held an event in Bryant Park um, calling dog owners to come down uh, with their pets so he could uh, photograph a mass um, group on the lawn in Bryant Park. Uh, Elliot is known for his uh, photos of, of dogs. Um, and it, it's always good to arrive early and stay late. Um, I arrived early for the event and was just kind of, you know, watching what was going on. And Elliot came over and instead of preparing for this mass, like, photo shoot, came down and sat down next to this guy uh, who was talking with his dog and never took his picture. He just sat there and observed them with his camera in his lap. There's, there's crime we cover on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, this is an NYPD officer at a crime scene. Um, I like to think I've been to the basement and the ceiling of 
of uh, New York uh, in my assignments. This is hundreds of feet underground uh, building the uh, new water system up in the Bronx. Uh, and these are the, the sand hogs, the urban miners, which are working below our feet every day. And sometimes you find Waldo. This is the uh, San Gennaro uh, festival on Mulberry Street. It's rare that I cover sports, because like Craig said, uh, there is an A-list uh, sports, you know, sports photographers here in the city. I'm more the B or C list. If, if uh, more than one team makes it to a, uh, to a playoff and it's starting to run thin or we need additional shooters at a sporting event, I'll get to go. But this was more of a news feature uh, snowboarding event that was set up along the East River. And uh, there wasn't any media access uh, up in this position, but from photographing in the media spot down below where they would come to the end of this ramp and perform their tricks, you really couldn't get the perspective of where it was. Uh, I mean, it could have been any half pipe anywhere. Um, so uh, when one of these snowboarders, you know, came down off the ramp, I just approached him and started chatting him up and just walked with him back up to the, to the start again, was able to make a couple of pictures before I got tossed. <laughs> Um, one of the things I enjoy the most is photos that are like a byproduct of an assignment you're, you were sent on. Um, so this was an enterprise weather photo uh, that came out of a non-incident car accident by the Holland Tunnel. Um, I was at the approach to the, to the tunnel and I noticed, and the accident wasn't serious, I don't think there was going to be a story, there wasn't going to be any coverage, but I noticed a man standing on the roof looking over at the scene unfolding of all the police and the fire trucks. Um, and it was a very hot day. So I managed to get his attention and he comes down and he lets me into the building and I went up and I hung out with him and his, I think his girlfriend uh, for a few minutes and just made a weather photo. It, uh, this is another one of those annual events that I like to go to to try to challenge myself to make it look different every year. Um, this is Operation Flags In. It happens uh, the few days before Memorial Day every year. Uh, Boy Scouts, uh, people of the military um, place a flag at each grave uh, in the military uh, cemeteries. Um, everyone's seen iconic photos that come out of uh, Arlington, but uh, this is Cypress Hills National Cemetery in Brooklyn. Um, it's got a soft spot in my career because it was one of the first places I was sent to to kind of prove myself to get a permalance uh, position at the post when I was a freelancer. Uh, I got sent out on Memorial Day say, there are these few events that are happening, go out and make a picture. Um, and Cypress Hill Cemetery was uh, one of those places. This is the annual uh, cardboard regatta that happens at Curtis High School in Staten Island every year. Uh, engineering classes build uh, boats out of cardboard and duct tape and have to paddle them back and forth across the high school pool and last boat standing wins. Awesome. <laughs> this, goes, this goes back to uh, the editorial illustration that we have to do. So we were doing a story about the last handful of phone booths that are in Manhattan. Because uh, there's no public phones any, you know, anymore. So uh, there are several phone booths. And this was several years ago. I don't even know if they're still there. This is up on West End Avenue, uh, you know, way uptown. And how do we, you know, illustrate the phone booth? So I came up with Superman. Um, it, like, you know, if the phone booths are gone, he'll have nowhere to change. Um, so um, I called up a buddy of mine and said, do you want to be Superman in a phone booth? And I said, you know, you're on your lunch. Get over to this corner. I've got a T-shirt for you, and, and we'll do it. Hey, Chad. Yep. So we have, we have a question. Hello, back. We have a, a question from the Internet. Great. Asking about uh, your... your lens usages and kits and, and that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, working as a tabloid photographer, um, my kit is um, two uh, Canon 1D Mark IV bodies uh, and, a, um, and a group of uh, zoom lenses. Um, I don't have the, the latitude really to use you know, primes, uh, you know, given the situations that we're in that are constantly changing or like scrums outside courthouses. Um, so it's... Um, uh, three basic that I uh, have with me every day. It's a 17 to 35, a 28 to 70, and a 70 to 200. 
one more uh, editorial illustration. This was uh, for a security story that went around the High Holy Days um, in the Jewish faith for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Um, this is uh, Rabbi Moskowitz who gives uh, self-defense classes um, and is an advocate for um, you know being self-aware and prepared for any you know anything to happen. Um, so we went to a this is a synagogue in Queens and they demonstrated for us some hand-to-hand -hand combat and uh, weapon work. Um, uh, this made the front page the next day with the headline "Chosen Guns." <laughs> It's some more weather. It's constant, constantly weather. Coney Island. These were uh, dumpsters uh, in Gowanus, Brooklyn, that were converted into uh, pools that you could pay uh, per day to go out and swim if you wanted to. Sometimes it's a day in the life of the naked cowboy. Uh, back in, I think it was 2009, a uh, cowboy had uh, an unsuccessful uh, run for mayor. Uh, so we did a day in the life. Uh, we went to his home, uh, and I was surprised he answered his door in boxer shorts. <laughs> and one of, he has a very rigorous daily routine, and uh, one of them is painting his Fruit of the Looms for the day. This is the uh, Big Apple Circus uh, in Lincoln Center. Uh, some of the daily grind is um, events that uh, take place that are advertised uh, on the AP Daybook. And uh, sometimes we show up to see if they would make a feature kind of standalone uh, photo that you could run in the paper. Um, this is another one I went to early. Um, the rest of the media was down by the fountain looking up at uh, Bellow, a uh, tightrope uh, walker. I went super early. Uh, talked them into letting me onto the roof of the building and sat there in the baking sun for an hour and a half before the thing actually went off so I could have this better perspective looking down at the plaza with the people to show how high he was and the bu buildings of Midtown. Sometimes it's in Victoria's Secret's closet with Miranda Kerr. My wife was thrilled about this one. We make difficult decisions um, covering, you know, even like the simplest of news conferences. Um, you can see the media off to the left of this, this frame here. This was on the, the first anniversary of the Miracle on the Hudson. Um, they brought as many passengers from the plane uh, back to speak and meet with Sully. And there was you know, several passengers spoke, and if we stood, you know, in front of the microphones, you would have, you know, a better, you know, picture of, you know, the, the people speaking and Sully speaking. For me, it was about his interaction, you know, with the people, which, and you know, there was a whole like private meet and greet which we weren't allowed uh, t to be at. So I wanted to wait for him to interact with, you know, all these lives that he had saved. So I forewent the you know standard front and center position and I went way off to the side and it was either going to work or it wasn't. If Sully never turned around there wouldn't be a picture but I'm like there's no way he's going to be able to stand in front of all these people and, with his back to them the entire time and not address them and sure enough I was right and I think it worked out in my favor. It's another one of those annual um, you know daily routine kind of assignments. This is the annual um, uh, audition for the American Ballet Theater. And having worked for a wire service and a small newspaper and now a large newspaper, um, I feel like I have to balance sometimes the way I would like to photograph assignments and the way I have to photograph assignments. Because, uh, you know, each you know, publication has its, you know, formula for like, you know, the way it displays photographs and, you know, the, the way that they you know, want things uh, shot. Uh, so this was um, when uh, the Sandhogs uh, broke through and completed tunneling for the seven line extension. So this is deep under Port Authority bus terminal. And uh, I love this one because it, it felt like a throwback to me of like, you know, the, all the, you know, the guys who are working on the job and that you know, victorious um, end to it. But then there were moments like this where I, I think I would, you know, would approach it more this way, but the previous photo was the one that wound up getting published. 
I feel sometimes the, the job doesn't end, and maybe I bring that on, you know, upon myself. That's what you get for listening to the police radios on your way home, and you're not on the clock anymore. Uh, and there was a, a large multi-alarm brush fire uh, in a national park in Staten Island. Um, so this was on the way home. And this is a moment where the firefighters are scrambling down off their truck because uh, the brush fire was going to jump the road to the other side. Some fireworks over the Staten Island Ferry. Uh, this was a, uh, an event celebrating um, Cunard uh, Cruise Lines had uh, three of their ships, I think, in town. It was the first time all three of them were going to be together and there were going to be fireworks, but they didn't bring the ships far enough down the Hudson for them to be in the photo with the Statue of Liberty, at least from the perspective that I chose. This is from Red Hook, Brooklyn. Um, so I did the Staten Island Ferry instead. Some more you know, daily uh, crime and grime that we uh, run into. This was a shoplifter being apprehended by a security guard from the Sims department store, which is just a, a block or two away. I've done a lot of stuff with the military locally, never um, embedded, uh, I've never been to war. Um, uh, this was a Fleet Week uh, assignment. Uh, this uh, sailor was coming off of uh, one of the ships and uh, being flown by helicopter uh, back to Manhattan to see his family. Uh, his 11 years in the Navy, this was his first helicopter ride. Coney Island. Uh, here's this, these next two frames, this is another example of like the byproducts, how one assignment turns into another. Um, this was for the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. I got to travel to meet up with um, different people who were in some of the iconic images to come out of that day. This is George Slay, uh, who had um, what was called in the media the longest walk to freedom. He worked on one of the highest levels of one of the towers and then uh, was photographed covered in dust uh, when he made it out to Wall Street. Um, he moved back to a uh, suburb of Cleveland, Ohio, uh, and I had to photograph him in his new uh, suburban environment. It ran side by side with the iconic photo in a special magazine uh, that we did, but uh, I had never been to Cleveland before, uh, so when I checked into the hotel, I asked the concierge, you know, what's going on you know, in town, and she just happened to mention to me that they were filming um, an Avengers movie around the corner. And a lot of the things they had in the street was put out there to meant, uh, and meant to look like New York. So there was, a, there was an MTA bus, there was a fire truck and a police car. Um, so I went out and checked it out for a couple of hours. Um, and people were, you know, they were rehearsing, they were running back and forth. Um, and I was just about to give up because I made some pictures um, you know, to show that they made it look like New York. Maybe I could do it as like a Sunday for Monday kind of feature. But then uh, they were readying everyone for their take. You know, this one they were going to film and do it for real. And someone said, fire in the hole. So I stuck around. And there's the picture. <laughs> um, so uh, people in NYPD you know, uniforms and pedestrians in this huge explosion. Um, and I call, up, uh, I call up the editor and I pitch this to them and, uh, and they thought it was great. This was page three in the newspaper the next day back in New York and uh, a lot of the morning shows uh, that do things with the newspapers like held this up and showed it on television. This is also the uh, 10th anniversary of 9-11. Uh, of this was the first time that um, relatives and visitors were able to interact with the Memorial Plaza. And this is a young lady um, remembering uh, her friend and roommate. Um, and this is this woman's boyfriend, um, a sergeant who served in Afghanistan. Sometimes it's being ready for anything. Um, I always have a camera with me. I left it home once, I will never do it again because uh, it came back to bite me. Um, when I was working at the AP in that first job, I rode the ferry every morning to work, and I get off in Manhattan, and cops and firefighters were coming out of every, you know, everywhere, and it turned out someone had, the ferry that I just got off as it left for Staten Island again, someone had jumped off the back of the ferry. And it was the one day that I consciously left my camera at home, 
because it was in the middle of winter and it was cold and I'm like, you know what, I'm not gonna schlep it today. Um, and I, never again. I went back into the ferry terminal, I bought a $12 film point and shoot camera and threw my reserve card on and walked back into the terminal to the end of the, you know, to the end of the pier and made some really awful frames because it was on this disposable camera of the uh, rescue operation. Uh, the story never went anywhere because they didn't find anyone in the water, it was unfounded. Uh, but here's one of those situations where like, if you don't carry your camera with you, you're not going to get Darth Vader on the sub. This is a NYPD graduation, an assignment that we've all have covered uh, in New York at Madison Square Garden. Or sometimes when you're working at the courthouse, there's a strange taxi accident. <laughs> uh, I still can't figure out how this guy got up on this thing. Um, and he was waiting for tow trucks to come and take him down. They've changed this media now. There's like red cones that like surround this thing. Um, I've been doing some ongoing work at uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral with their um, restoration. Um, this is Ash Wednesday. Um, this is one of the assignments that's stuck with me um, personally and, and emotionally. Um, I was sent just to cover Ash Wednesday Mass, just like we would any other year. Um, and the, the good folks at St. Pat's were corralling the media to move us to another place where um, Cardinal Dolan, who was just elevated to Cardinal a week before, um, this was his first you know, bit in front of the, the New York media after returning from Rome. Uh, so they were gonna corral us off to the side and he was gonna come and talk to us. And I didn't go with the corral. Because the Cardinal went off to one other side and he was giving ashes uh, to celebrants. So I stuck with him instead, and we came around, after he was giving ashes, we came around the back of St. Pat's to the Lady Chapel, and he had this interaction with this altar boy. Um, and I made this picture. And then the Cardinal went on to talk to the media, and I stayed and I spoke to the altar boy and his mom. And it turns out, the altar boy only came to St. Pat's that day because he wanted to see the Cardinal for the first time after coming back from Rome. He's an altar boy from Staten Island. Uh, he had just dropped his dad off for treatment at Sloan Kettering, and they came to the cathedral to pray and to see the cardinal. Get my water. Um, and while talking to one of the other clergy at the cathedral, uh, they decided they were going to take him downstairs, give him vestments, and he was going to serve mass. Um, so there's another photo that ran uh, in the paper the next day where you could see, you know, both faces. Um, but this was my favorite of the, of the two. Um, and the relationship continued between uh, the Cardinal and the boy's father every several weeks who would call and he, they would invite them back to the cathedral, so it's, it's stuck with me. This is when the, the shuttle uh, came to town. It, it looked fake going by. <laughs> Craig, I think you were standing next to me when we made these pictures. Um, uh, this is when they were hoisting the beam uh, when One World Trade Center was becoming uh, the tallest at the time in Manhattan. Uh, given the opportunity when we go into like the tall skyscrapers in Manhattan, I'm always looking out the windows because you never know what you're going to find or make a stock image of the neighborhood that you're in. Um, so we were doing a story, I think, about noise pollution at one of like the, the hotels and I'm like looking over the side and there was a sunbather that made yet another weather photo for the next day's paper. This is uh, one of the images um, from Sandy, uh, which I'll get into uh, a bit later. Uh, um, this was the first image I made after leaving home. Uh, the next morning, this big uh, oil tanker had washed, uh, washed ashore. This is the early crowd arriving for uh, New Year's Eve in Times Square. This is part of uh, my project with the ongoing restoration. These are all the pipe organ, uh, the, the pipes from the organ at St. Pat's Cathedral laid out at the uh, Paragallo Organ Company, which is uh, doing the restoration. Uh, cleaning all the pipes, retuning them, and eventually returning them back to the choir loft. Um, here's one of those uh, where you, know, you get lucky. Um, this was 4th of July. Um, I had to photograph the reopening of the Statue of Liberty, which was closed uh, since uh, Hurricane Sandy. Um, 
and I was waiting for just the right you know, person on, you know, on the boat. Um, th this little girl and her American girl uh, counterpart um, just made the, the perfect picture. And then it went one step further. It was this little girl's birthday. Here, here, here's one that's you know, advertised off the AP Day book that you don't know whether it's going to make a picture or not. And uh, being a Mini Cooper driver, I had to go to this one. <laughs> Um, this is a fiberglass boat made up to look like uh, a Mini Cooper, and it's coming across the harbor. It's the de Blasio family doing their infamous Smackdown dance on election night. This was one of my uh, favorites uh, from recent. Uh, we did a sit-down interview with Ray Kelly in one of his final days as police commissioner when that administration was ending. And it's one of those situations where you're given a very short amount of time with the person that's being interviewed. And then they put the lid on it and they like toss you out. Um, so he brought us into his personal conference room uh, up in, within the confines of his office. And it's like the bat cave. Um, and this digital image was, you know, on the screens behind him. Um, and I made some, you know, pictures while I was like standing next to him, shooting with a, a wider lens. And our reporter is just off to the right of this frame, sitting next to him. They let me photograph for a few minutes, and then they said, you know, that's it. And they were talking, but I didn't get kicked out of the room. And I had a remote strobe off on a stand, so I left it there. And it was dialed down so far that, you know, even when it went off, it was giving off like very, you know, a little bit of light that it, it wasn't bothering the commissioner. So I went back to the other end of the conference room table and I was shooting at long lens. And finally, you know, he relaxed after speaking with the reporter for a few minutes and got into this more like relaxed position. And it was my favorite from the shoot. It's like the godfather sitting there at the end of the table. <laughs> Uh, this is from a series that I do on the ferry, which I'm going to show you a little bit later, um, which uh, makes great weather pictures. I thought the harbor was so frozen, it almost looked like you could walk to Manhattan. Uh, it was really cold riding outside on the ferry, but worth it for the picture. And uh, I like to live by if you see something, shoot something. <laughs> Uh, this wasn't far uh, from my home when I was leaving on my, on my commute. And it had snowed so much by this time. And this nun was out there shoveling her own, her own sidewalk. And I couldn't find a place to pull over fast enough because the curbs were filled with snow mounds. So I pull over in somebody else's driveway and I like jump out of the car with the long lens. And I had like a good distance to go back before I got to the nun. So I was making pictures as I went. And by the time I got back up to her, she had finished. Um, so I just had a short conversation with her, and uh, this wound up being front page the next day uh, with the headline, Lord have mercy, uh, like no more snow or something to that effect. Uh, I, don't, I don't get to shoot sports uh, all that often, but I got asked to do a Barclays tournament uh, last year, and this is a golfer hitting out of the rough from in between two trees. We cover the president, as Craig said. When uh, the facade uh, of the piece of the restoration was completed, I wanted to do something with the cardinal and the front of the cathedral showing you know, how bright and white it was. And they had redone the bronze doors out in front. Um, so ask and ye shall receive. Um, uh, this is during Advent, um, one of the masses before Christmas time. And uh, I asked the cardinal if uh, when processing you know, out of the church, if he would go all the way out to the to the front, to the sidewalk, so I can make a couple of pictures, and he obliged. Here's another one of those annual events I like to go to because it makes pictures every time. Um, this is a 4th of July event, um, and I know uh, a lot of the, uh, on 4th of July, you know, the picture in the next, the, the paper in the next day you're usually going to see is fireworks. But for the early edition, there needs to be a placeholder. So there needs to be a picture on that page that they could then swap out for fireworks pictures from later in the evening. Um, so I like to go to this event 
it's the annual uh, hook fin fishing contest. Uh, and then they do like a whole costume bit, excuse me, um, with folks dressed up like Becky Thatcher and Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer at this little fishing hole in Staten Island. I like the features it makes. If you see something, shoot something. Uh, I was in my car, it was almost at the uh, end of my shift, I'm getting ready to go home and this afternoon thunderstorm it comes over and I didn't want to get drenched, so I stayed in the car and I was shooting people running for cover from my car window. And I caught out of the corner of my eye in the background this guy with a cigar just sitting there. I'm like, I have to get out of the car now. Um, so I got very wet making the photo, but it was very worth it. Uh, unfortunately, the man didn't want to identify himself, uh, so he's just an anonymous cigar smoker, but he did give me a great quote. It's always. 80 degrees and sunny when you're smoking a cigar. I've had like a weather theme inadvertently. Um, this was just the other day uh, and at four o'clock in the afternoon, the photo editors, uh, I guess, didn't have enough page, you know, page lead photos. They needed something to fill space. And so the go out, it's hot outside, go out and make a weather photo. Um, but it wasn't sunny. And sometimes we really need that bright, harsh sunlight to really convey how hot it is. So this one was difficult to find, but I was lucky enough to find this poor exhausted soul uh, who had loosened his tie and kicked off his shoes and was just taking a break in a plaza in Midtown. Um, and was able to, you know, 45 minutes after I was asked for weather, I was able to get something back to the office to fill the spot in the paper. Um, the next couple are um, a bit of my stuff from Hurricane Sandy. Uh, safe travels, Craig. Thank you for, uh, for staying for my bit. Um, Sandy, the Sandy coverage was difficult uh, for me being a Staten Islander, which was one of the neighborhoods that was hardest hit outside of Breezy Point, Queens. Um, and I worked uh, the Staten Island neighborhoods for 30 straight days um, after the floods. Uh, so this is the next morning uh, after the floods. So this is Midland Avenue in, in Staten Island. And uh, this gentleman who unfortunately isn't identified, uh, he got too far out into the water before I was able to get his information, um, went in looking for his brother. And this was only, you know, four miles maybe from my home. So there was, um, almost a, you know, like a survivor's guilt. Um, there was no power in my house, so it was cold and it was dark. Um, and I had very little property damage and it couldn't even compare to what some of my neighbors in other uh, parts of Staten Island went through. Um, so spending all day with them, like dawn to dusk, and then you know, going back home and having you know, a, a home to go back to was very difficult for me. This is uh, the funeral of a police officer uh, who died in his home after uh, saving seven relatives from his basement. He drowned. You know, sometimes there were instances where you know, people lost more than a home. Um, this was a family member uh, of the Trena family uh, who lives down in Newdorp Beach. They lost a home and a business both in the same neighborhood. And you can see the spot where the drywall is cracked there was the water line in this house. Um, and one of their relatives from Seattle came in to help them you know, clean out their home. And this home had gone untouched for days. I was working in this neighborhood and there was finally somebody there. So I approached and I was talking to them. Um, and after I made a couple of pictures, I spent the rest of the afternoon just helping them shovel out debris from their home because it felt more of an obligation to do that than tell their story that day. Joe Ingenito is another uh, Sandy survivor from the Newdorp Beach area. Uh, he had a large tree, uh, other than you know, flooding and the other you know, damage that you know, people had, there was a large tree that came down in his yard. Um, and he took the top of the tree and he put it out on the sidewalk, even though it was just the end of October, and decorated it for the holidays to try to bring a little bit of a Christmas spirit um, to the neighborhood. And um, working for the Post, um, 
it wasn't always about the larger, you know, disaster, you know, images which you're going to get several times over from the wire services. It was more my job to find little personal vignettes, you know, to go along with the larger story. Um, so this day that I met Joe happened to be the day that the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree was going up. So there was this juxtaposition between how the entire city, you know, was celebrating like it does every year and this little Charlie Brown Christmas tree that's in this Sandy affected neighborhood. Uh, this picture of President Obama was done, I mean, this is planning. Um, a couple of days before, I went to scout the neighborhoods because we knew that the president was coming t you know, to town. We had to try to figure out which areas in Staten Island he was going to go to, which wasn't disclosed. And because I had been working in these neighborhoods for weeks already at this point, uh, it was really easy to spot you know, the government officials that usually come in advance of a presidential visit. Um, so I got there early. I left all of my uh, pro gear, like the big cameras and the big lenses, in the car. And I walked into the neighborhood because they were checking all the vehicles and checking IDs to make sure you lived in the neighborhoods. Um, and I went down. Uh, and so the only uh, cameras I had on me was my little pocket cam uh, camera, my Canon G11. And I went down to Joe and Janito's house with his Christmas tree and hung out with him all morning. And then with the regular residents of the neighborhood who were allowed to go out onto the street to try to have a, a moment with the president. Um, and the president just happened to stop and embrace this family that was standing right in front of me. And I was able to capture this moment. This is the Camarada family of New York Beach. The president actually stood there and spoke to Dominic and his wife for several minutes. It's more than, you know, if you went into the Oval Office and tried to have a minute, you know, with the president, these two folks got more time and probably laid it out more on the line than anybody else could. This is uh, Pedro uh, Correa. He's a New York State Corrections Officer and an Iraqi veteran um, standing in front of the remnants of his home. This was for the month uh, anniversary of the storm. Um, by this point, you know, I was even, you know, worn out from covering, you know, the same like storm coverage uh, every day. So I went to a spot where that I know had been photographed before, um, but I had I hadn't been to, uh, and we just happened to encounter the homeowner, uh, uh, Mr. Correa, and he told us the most harrowing story about how he sent his wife and child away and spent his night in his home and wound up floating away on the second story of his house which wound up in a field uh, several hundred yards away. And uh, he remarked to us that he was more scared uh, that night during the storm than he was serving overseas. Uh, I've spent a lot of uh, time with the, with the military. I enjoy the pomp and circumstance that, with, that comes with a, a lot of it. This is a PR mission. Uh, for the military. Um, this is aboard the USS New York. Uh, it's a ship made from seven and a half tons of steel salvaged from the World Trade Center. Uh, so being a photographer that covered the 9-11 attacks, um, this was kind of uh, you know, a homecoming even you know, for me to bring something full circle back to New York. Um, so there were a lot of locals that serve uh, aboard the USS New York that request uh, to serve on the ship because they're proud to be New Yorkers. And uh, this was one of those assignments where I traveled without uh, a reporter. At the last minute, there were space constraints in my office had to decide whether they were going to send a reporter or a photographer because um, they couldn't send both of us. So they sent me because they figured they could always write to the images or the information that I was sending back. So I had to act. Uh, as both, uh, really, on this trip. Um, pitching stories back to the editors, and um, there was a lot going on on the ship. The Yankees were playing in the World Series, um, so folks would stay up at night to uh, watch the games in the, uh, in the mess halls. Uh, it was also Halloween, so people were trick-or-treating on board. Uh, so I pitched the World Series story, I pitched the Halloween story. There was everybody watching Andy Pettit. Uh, this is uh, an officer uh, from Long Island uh, who spent his last 343 days in the Navy before he retired from his career um, celebrating the fire department. He wrote a different firefighter's name 
on his hat every day as he served other enlisted officers in the mess hall, which wouldn't normally be his job because he was an officer. It was a full drugstore on board. These are uh, two Marines uh, who had been together since uh, basic training, who had both never been to New York before, and this is their first glimpse of the New York skyline as the ship is making its way past uh, Long Island. The mayor came on board, thanked the troops. And this is finally bringing the ship home to New York and passing under the Verrazano and entering into New York Harbor. While I was on board, um, I was treated really differently being a civilian um, with like longer hair and a beard and I felt like I was always getting these canned responses and kind of like the cold shoulder uh, from the men and women serving on board. Um, so I pitched the first person story where I was going to go through the military transformation. Um, shaved off the beard and I'm going to get the, the military haircut in the, in the barber shop. And the office then told me that they weren't interested in that, so you know I had shaved off the beard for nothing. And so right before I got the haircut, uh, you know they told me they weren't interested, so I didn't do it. But uh, word travels fast, I've learned, on these Navy ships. Uh, so I had members of the service calling me out on not going through with it, that I chickened out. And it went all the way up the ranks to the colonel who was in charge of all the Marines that were on board. And he called me out on it. Well, I'm not letting a Marine Corps colonel call me out on not shaving my head. So I said, let's do it. And um, the Marine, uh, the colonel himself, Colonel Mark Desens, um, shaved my head on board the boat. It was an awful haircut. Uh, here's one of those situations where you know I have to work kind of like the sidelines uh, of the story and not be inside Yankee Stadium. This is the old Yankee Stadium on the, the last game. Uh, I was entrusted with uh, finding an auxiliary-like spot to you know photograph you know some atmosphere and specifically get the sunset behind the stadium. Uh, so this is on top of an apartment building uh, across the street uh, from the stadium where some residents uh, let us in and we're uh, partying up on top. And there's Derek Jeter through the iconic uh, facade of the stadium as the introductions were being made. Celebrating a home run. There's a gentleman uh, dressed uh, as Babe Ruth and some other folks with Bye Bye Babe. This frame just kind of made itself. And there's the sunset. How are we on time? Okay. Um, let's do uh, the, the workflow. Um, so with recent work, I find myself being told that we're not a wire service, yet sometimes we have to operate like a wire service. So this is a run-of-the-mill press conference with the mayor and the police commissioner when they made the announcement where you could now have up to this amount of marijuana on you and not get arrested. And they're watching, the editors are back in the office and they're watching it live on television. And the second they see this image of the commissioner holding up this bag of what was oregano, um, I'm getting text messages saying, file that photo as soon as possible. And the press conference is still going on. <laughs> um, so uh, for the last two years, I've used iFi cards in my cameras, uh, which I, I think has been the best um, addition to my workflow that I've made. Um, so even before I got the text message from the boss, I was already downloading the image out of my camera when you don't even have to stop shooting and s transmitting it back to the office. So minutes later, here's how it appeared on our iPhone and iPad apps. And just to show that the press conference is still going on, here it is on my phone still at the press conference and how it appeared in the paper the next day. <laughs> I find that the, the i5 for me works uh, best in like the breaking news situations. This is the, I would never transmit an entire job that way. Um, so my cameras uh, shoot dual CF and SD cards. So I write a raw file to the, uh, to the compact flash 
and my SD card is the iFi. So in case I'm um, getting yelled at, like we need something right away for the web or a situation like that, I'm able to immediately uh, download uh, a JPEG. I put a boilerplate caption on it and ship it straight to the office without even having to stop shooting the assignment. And that was the case for the East, this is the East Village uh, fire and building collapse from earlier this year where um, they were doing live uh, blogging. They were constantly, they were t posting things on social media from the paper, the tweeting and the Instagram. Um, and uh, Panorama. Uh, so sometimes the iPhone is the best uh, tool to use um, to make the picture. Um, there were a couple of minutes where the sun had broken through and uh, was silhouetted, you know, behind the, the clouds here. And I wanted to show how it was like, you know, you know, bright and sunny on one side and the build, you know, the buildings in Midtown on the other. So the iPhone panorama just happened to be the best way to accomplish this. there for hours and once you have a, an aerial position like this over a breaking news assignment you usually get stuck up there for hours so this is a secondary collapse that destroyed a uh, police car recently I found myself sitting on the desk um, a lot uh, for a little over a year and um, then spots here and there. Uh, I got asked to work as a photo assignment editor, uh, which took me off the street, and I wasn't making pictures every day, and I was getting frustrated. Um, so being a Staten Islander, riding what you know, Staten Islanders call the boat, uh, back and forth every day, uh, I started this Instagram series called The Nautical Commute, and I would photograph what would be a mundane you know, commute to the office every day, because I never get tired of it. I'm constantly amazed at the uh, scenery. Uh, I remember even from my first uh, job at the AP when I was commuting to Midtown every day, how like I would sit outside and I would just feel so lucky that you know I'm working as a photographer or an, or an editor in, in New York. It always amazes me. Are there any questions out there? Are these Instagram photos? These are these are all from the Instagram series. It's hashtag nautical commute. Uh, I'm Chad Rock on Instagram. Um, on occasion, uh, they've made uh, they've made the paper. <laughs> uh, for, uh, this is the blizzard that happened uh, earlier this winter. Um, some of them are shot uh, with uh, my pro gear. Uh, some of them are iPhone photos. It's a mix. and then uh, all posted to Instagram. Hey, Chad. Hi there. I'm going to try not to heckle you. Um, so that iPhone pano of the fire, gorgeous, beautiful. Um, so using those now for newspapers, uh, did you do any post on that in the camera, in the phone, and are there any ethical considerations now when you use your phone on an assignment? Uh, there are no raw files. God knows how much post is going on there. Um, how are newspapers treating those these days? Um, there is, uh, there was very little post uh, on that photo. It's just an HDR um, filter that was put on it in post and, uh, and nothing else. Uh, I'm always uh, clear in uh, my captioning uh, saying that, you know, it's an HDR photo, which is a high dynamic range, which even, you know, in these days, I think there's more, you know, latitude because um, there's a lot of uh, post-production, you know, even going into like some of the wire, you know, photographs which are heavily vignetted and, you know, and, you know, really darkened down to be moody. Um, there aren't any ethical concerns um, being, shot on a, uh, being shot on a smartphone because it's a camera just like any other camera. And that's pretty much it for me if there's no other, All right. there's no other questions. That was awesome. Any questions before we head out? Great work, Jim.